welcome to the lecture on automatic parallelization. Typically, we look at conversion of uh, sequential programs to parallel programs by a compiler. This is the process of uh, automatic uh, parallelization. So, first of all, you know, we must understand why automatic parallelization is essential. You see, the parallel programming of uh, you know vector processors or uh, multi core processors or multi processors is an extremely difficult task for example even you know with four core processors we can have four threads and that is the uh, you know and you can even have 10 threads if there is enough uh, if the speed of the processor is high so and managing all the 10 threads their you know communication and uh, sharing of data structures etc is definitely not easy for a programmer especially novice programmers cannot write concurrent programs without uh, difficulty that's the reason why automatic parallelization which converts sequential programs to parallel programs which actually guarantees correctness of uh, the program parallel program has become popular Research in this direction has been going on from 1969 really by David Cook and others and uh, it was actually it reached some saturation point uh, somewhere in the early 90s, but with the advent of multi core processors it has really picked up uh, vigorously all over again. So, the target uh, for a um, you know parallel automatic parallelizer may be a vector processor in which case it is called vectorization. It could be a multi core processor and we call this process as concurrentization or it could be a cluster of uh, loosely coupled distributed memory processors. So, we call this pa process as parallelization in general. So, parallelism extraction process is uh, normally a source to source transformation. Well, there are uh, reasons for this possibly we could do this on binary, but the effectiveness is uh, much lower. What happens is uh, when we look at uh, you know sequential programs, uh, the uh, loops with array access are the most important. The others you know scalars and uh, non loop parts of the program are important, but they do not really give you too much speed up even when it is run on a parallel processor. So, in, when you have arrays the basic question that we must ask during parallelization is when we have two array accesses are these two accesses to the same location of the array. So, if it is a read access from both of them then there is no problem, but uh, if one of them writes and the other reads or both of them write to the same location then they cannot do so in parallel they must be asked to do in the program order. So, this is the basic question that is asked and uh, this is asked during a phase called dependence analysis. To answer this question you know well we require the expression of uh, the array uh, subscript itself. So, when we use an array we have an index expression. So, we need the expression in order to perform this dependence analysis and that is the reason why we would like the parallelism transformation sequential to parallel program transformation to be a source to source transformation. So, this requires dependence analysis to determine dependence between statements which is what I mentioned just now and implementation of available parallelism is also a challenge. So, if you have a single loop and uh, let us say it runs from 1 to 1 million and there are 4 processors cores available we could simply say you know uh, 2.5 lakh uh, iterations per uh, uh, thread would run and on each processor and uh, there would be four threads running. So, within the threads the 2.5 lakh iterations would run in sequential mode, but what if uh, there is a doubly nested loop. So, and uh, let us say both, I, both the loops can be run in parallel. In such a case, can we actually benefit from parallelizing both the loops one nested inside another 
does the uh, you know processor have enough parallelism enough number of processors to give you a benefit in such a case so this is uh, the question that is asked when we look at implementation of available parallelism so let us uh, start with some simple examples some of these we saw during uh, introduction to optimization so here is a for loop for i equal to 1 to 100 do x i equal to x i plus y i this code can be very easily converted to a vector processor code x of 1 colon 100 equal to x of 1 colon 100 plus y of 1 colon 100. The code can be run on a vector processor in constant amount of time O1 amount of time. The reason is uh, we assume that there are uh, enough number of vector registers available. So, let us say 100 of them. So, the x and y components are fetched in parallel and then they are added and then they are written into the x uh, vector register. So, this is how it goes. So, the uh, entire uh, read process on 100 items of x and y will happen in constant amount of time. The addition takes constant amount of time and then the writing also takes constant amount of time. So, this vectorization is possible uh, because uh, there is no dependence you know between these iterations. For example, this writes x 1 equal to x 1 plus y 1, the second iteration writes x 2 equal to x 2 plus y 2. So, each iteration writes and reads different uh, x and y items. So, there is no dependence from one iteration to another. The same example, the program can also be run on a multi core processor. So, what we write is uh, for all i equal to 1 to 100 do x i equal to y i x i plus y i. So, what happens is there will be 100 iterations running as separate threads uh, you know assuming that uh, there are 100 cores possible. Each thread actually owns uh, a different i value. So, for i equal to 1 there is a thread 2 equal, the i equal to 2 there is another thread and so on and each thread is responsible for executing uh, you know one of the uh, iterations. So, x i equal to x i plus y i. So, since the y values are all different again uh, each thread writes and reads from a different uh, x location and y location. So, that is how it is run on a multi core processor. Whether it is uh, uh, useful to run 100 uh, threads or not is a matter of uh, detail you know in practical situations we may not be using so many threads, but that we will see later. The next example, something that cannot be parallelized. So, you have for i equal to 1 to 100 do x of i plus 1 equal to x i plus y i. So, if you simply write this as vector code x of uh, 2 colon 101 equal to x of 1 colon 100 plus y of 1 colon 100, this would be wrong. So, the reason is uh, the dependence informally, let us see what this dependence is. So, let us uh, you know uh, substitute i equal to 1, 2, 3 etcetera and see what happens to these statements. With i equal to 1, the statement becomes x 2 equal to x 1 plus y 1, with i equal to 2, it becomes x 3 equal to x 2 plus y 2, with i equal to 3, it becomes x 4 equal to x 3 plus y 3 etcetera. So, you can see that with i equal to 1, we write into x of 2 and in i equal to 2, we read from x of 2. So, in other words what is written in the first iteration is read in the second iteration. Similarly, what is uh, written into in the second iteration that is x of 3 is read in the third iteration x of 3 again. So, there is a dependence from one iteration to the next iteration what is written in this iteration is read in the next iteration and because of this uh, dependence we cannot uh, you know run this code in vector mode because the vector statement which is given here implies that all the x values are read first and then uh, you know uh, added to the y values and placed in the x which would be incorrect the dependence uh, is not actually satisfied. So, this is a very simple example of code that cannot be parallelized. There are some assumptions on the programs you know form of uh, array subscripts and things like that which must be satisfied for performing dependence analysis which is one of the most important steps in parallelization. 
So, for example, array subscripts should be linear functions of uh, loop variables. I already mentioned that arrays are the most important in uh, parallelization. So, the form of uh, the subscripts, the index expressions in the array axis should be linear functions of loop variables. In other words, I cannot have uh, i square plus j square or i star j and things like that. I must have k star i plus uh, m star j etcetera, where k and m are uh, constants. So, linear functions of loop variables only. So, loop lower bound should be 1 and loop increment should be 1. So, this is uh, to make the analysis simpler and this is easy to actually make sure of as we will see very soon. A few transformations on loops are carried out to ensure the above conditions. Not uh, you know you cannot really make a nonlinear function of loop variables into a linear function, but uh, some normalization is possible. So, loop normalization is possible, induction variable substitution is possible, and expression folding and forward substitution are possible. So, we will see what these are. So, let us take a simple example the original loop is like this i equal to 1 to 100 do k i equal to i for j equal to 1 to 300 by 3 do and there are some statements inside. The first and foremost transformation is we want to make the loop lower bound 1 and the loop increment as 1. So, in both loops the loop lower bound is indeed 1. So, this is i equal to 1 and this is j equal to 1. So, that is satisfied already but the loop increment is not 1 in both the loops. So, in this loop it is 1, but in this loop it is 3. So, we want to change the loop to look as in the in this picture i equal to 1 to 100 do k i equal to i j equal to 1 to 100 do. So, we want to change the increment to 1. Obviously, when the increment is uh, changed to 1, the expressions which use j inside will have to undergo some change. So, here if you just expand j equal to 1, 2, 3 etcetera, we would have had u 1 equal to u 1 star w k i, u 2 equal to u 2 star w k i etcetera etcetera. So, uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, then uh, not u equal to j equal to 2, j equal to 1 and then uh, plus 3 j equal to 4. So, u of 4 equal to u of 4 plus into w of k i etcetera. So, we must jump j by 3. So, the uh, way of doing it is uh, multiply j by 3 and then uh, subtract 2. So, we have u of uh, 3 star j minus 2 equal to u of 3 star j minus 2 plus star w of k i. So, if you have j equal to 1 this would be 3 minus 2 which is 1. If you have j equal to 2 this becomes 3 into 2 6 minus 2 4 etcetera etcetera. So, the loop uh, you know the array subscripts are going to take the same values as before, but the loop has been changed to run from 1 to 100. Similarly, this is v of j plus 4. So, we would have uh, v of 5, v of uh, 8 etcetera etcetera. So, this 3 star j plus 1 is similar j equal to 1 this becomes v of 4, j equal to 2 this would be 3 into 2 6 plus 1 etcetera etcetera. So, uh, we will actually have uh, 7 here and 7 here then you know 7 plus 3 10. So, 3 into 3 plus 1 is 10 etcetera etcetera. So, the loop uh, indices are changed and the subscripts have been changed in order to satisfy this loop increment equal to 1. The next uh, you know pre processing on the loop is called induction variable substitution. So, recall we had induction variable elimination and along with it we had uh, strength uh, reduction. Here uh, we are going to do something similar, but in inverse fashion. Let us see what we are doing. So, recall this uh, keep this in your mind we have uh, normalized the loop here, we have changed the loop indices. Okay. So, now the loop runs from 1 to 100 as usual then k i equal to i and j equal to 1 to 100 that was the normalized loop. So, and uh, u equal to 3 star j minus 2 etcetera this was as before and v of 3 star j plus 1 etcetera this was also as before. And then we have uh, 
k i equal to k i plus 200 and j equal to 301. So, now uh, what has changed? The change is in the w part not in the u or v part. The reason is uh, here is a variable k i which is used in the w part w of k i the array w is accessed using uh, k i all right. And uh, actually k i is incremented by 2 in the j loop. So, it is actually an induction variable dependent on uh, j for the increment it starts with i then uh, so k i equal to i then i plus 2 i plus 3 i plus 4 i plus 5 etcetera etcetera in the j loop. So, this fact is actually made use of what we do is uh, we have i k i equal to i and then we instead of k having k i equal to k i plus 2 in the loop we actually insert w of k i plus 2 star j. So, every time j increments this increment is by 2. So, we effectively do k i plus 2 right here. Okay. So, and at the end we must give the value of k i that it would have got previously. So, that would be uh, here k i plus 200. Okay. So, that is how uh, we have eliminated uh, the addition to k i incrementing k i by uh, 2 every time. So, now k i is a constant in the j loop right. So, this is this does not vary in the j loop that is the advantage. So, this is the inverse of operator strength reduction that we perform during induction variable elimination. We have actually introduced 2 star j here in fact, we had k i equal to k i plus 2, but we have introduced k i plus 2 star j here. So, we are doing more work, but uh, we have eliminated the dependence on uh, you know the, the incrementing of k i within this loop k i now is a constant within this loop. So, with that done the next step is expression folding and uh, forward uh, substitution. So, uh, see this you know we had k i equal to i here. So, we just do forward substitution and replace this k i by i. So, that is what we do here. So, w i plus 2 star j is what we get here the rest end here also i plus 2 star j the rest of the program remains the same here since k i was a constant we could replace it by i. So, k i is i plus 200 and j is 301. So, suppose k i and j are actually not used later on they are not live after this point. Okay. Then in that case we can delete these two statements they will not be needed otherwise we need to retain them. Now, you can see that uh, all subscripts are linear functions of loop variables as needed for the dependence analysis. So, if you had looked at the original loop see this uh, you know this k i is something uh, uh, of course, uh, there in the loop now normal not normalized once we normalize it this k i was still a problem because uh, it was some variable which was not linearly dependent on i and j. So, in various steps we actually converted uh, k i either in uh, the dependence on k i to dependence on i and j and thereby the subscripts in this particular loop are all now linear and they are ready for uh, dependence analysis. Then, so how does one generate vector code? Let us say uh, we let us look at a glimpse of this process and then take up the details. So, you are given a loop uh, like this it has all the uh, you know uh, lower uh, loops are normalized okay. all the subscripts of uh, arrays etcetera etcetera are all linear functions of the index variables. So, then what do we do? Suppose you look at uh, you know the previous loop, okay, this particular loop, expand it, giving values for i and j. So well, that's what I have done here. So I put i equal to one and then j equal to one. The statement uh, s one is uh, this statement. So you can observe that three star j minus two, three star j minus two, i plus two star j. This is identical. This and this are identical. Similarly, 3 star j plus 1 and 3 star j minus 2 and then i plus 2 star j. So, just remember this and uh, now 
S 1 becomes u 1 equal to C 1 u 1 plus something, S 2 becomes V 4 equal to V 1 plus something and when we change J to 2, S 1 becomes u 2 equal to u 2 plus something and S 2 becomes V 7 equal to V 4 plus something. So, you can observe that uh, this particular uh, u 1 is read and then written into this is called as anti dependence. So, this type of anti dependence u 2 and then u 2 here is harmless for vectorization. So, it does not really pose any problems because all the vector registers are supposed to be read first and then written into. Okay. So, this does not pose problems, but the dependence S 2 delta S 2 prevent vectorization of S 2. So, S 2 is here and then uh, it is writing into V 4 and then S 2 in j equal to 2 is actually reading from V 4. That means, from this sentence S 2 to this sentence S 2 there is a dependence. That dependence is denoted as delta, it is write and then read, it is called as a flow dependence. And uh, if you observe the i index and j index and their relationships, this is happening in the same value of i. So, there is a, a small subscript called equal to here and then it is happening in different values of j writing is happening in j equal to 1 and reading is happening in j equal to 2 with 1 less than 2. So, the second subscript is less than. So, that is the relationship between the two subscripts that we have indicated here. This will become very clear, this is called as a direction vector, this will become very clear much later. So, the dependence and direction vector are the two items that we need to compute very accurately for vectorization and parallelization. So, because of uh, this dependence vectorization of S 2 is not possible, vectorization of S 1 is definitely possible. We do partial vectorization. So, for i equal to 1 to 100 do the statement S 1 is vectorized u of 1 to 298 colon 3 u colon 1 to 298 colon 3 star w etcetera etcetera. So, the S 1 statement has been completely vectorized, it runs in uh, vector mode. Whereas, the for j loop contains the uh, statement S 2 which cannot be vectorized. So, the j loop and the i loop run sequentially on this particular S 2. So, this is uh, the vector code generation process essentially we compute the dependences and the direction vectors and then we are going to look at some conditions on the dependences in order to tell us whether vectorization is possible or not possible. So, let us formally look at uh, the dependence relations. This was uh, an introduction that I gave you to vectorization so far. What is there are three types of dependence which are very important. One is the flow or true dependence, the second is the anti dependence and the third is the output dependence. In flow dependence the two statements S 1 and S 2 share a variable x S 1 writes into it and then S 2 in the same execution order reads from it later. So, this is called as a flow dependence because the value flows from this particular definition of x to this use of x. Anti dependence is the other way S 1 reads from x and then S 2 writes into x. So, you first read and then write. So, this is called as an anti dependence. This is depend, uh, shown as delta bar. Output dependence is you S 1 writes into x and then S 2 also writes into x, but then you cannot really you know change the order of S 1 and S 2. So, this is called as output dependence. For example, if output dependence is violated and the output device is a printer, the printed output may appear in jumbled form. And here we may actually end up you know if you write first and then uh, read you may actually get the wrong value. Whereas, here if you read first and then write you will still get a wrong value. In all the three forms of dependence we are really very seriously worried about uh, the flow dependence. It is called as true dependence and it cannot be removed by any means. Whereas, in the case of anti dependence if we really store the value of x in some temporary then actually you know right in the beginning 
then we can write into x any time. So, that particular uh, dependence you know we do not have to wait uh, make s 2 wait until s 1 is completed. If we have stored the value of x in some temporary variable, we can dispense with that. So, we can uh, instead of x in that case, we are actually going to use the uh, variable t in s 1 and thereby get rid of uh, the dependence. So, t would have stored the value of x right in the beginning of the uh, you know group of statements. So, anti dependence can be gotten rid of by using some temporary variables. So, in the case of output dependence, it is not possible to get rid of it by using temporaries, but uh, we can rename variables and get rid of it. For example, instead of using x and x in both places, if we simply change this to x and y, two different variables and uh, such renaming is always possible, we can get rid of output dependence. So, this is uh, since we can get rid of anti and output dependences, they are not treated on par with the flow or true dependence. Flow or true dependence cannot be gotten rid of. So, we will most of the time worry about uh, flow dependence, but uh, definitely if there is a need we will look at anti and output dependence as well. So, what exactly is this uh, direction vector that I mentioned just now? Informally let us understand the direction vector, the exact computation of uh, direction vectors will be taken up later. So, there are three types of uh, direction vector components possible. One is the forward component, the other is the backward component, third one is the equal to component. So, if we have the symbol less than it is called as a forward direction vector component. It means that the dependence from iteration i is to the iteration i plus k. In other words, we compute a quantity in iteration i say x equal to something and then use it in the iteration i plus k, k greater than say 0. So, computed in iteration i and used in iteration i plus k that is why this is called as a forward dependence and this less than is a relationship between i and i plus k, i is less than i plus k that is why the symbol is less than, but it is read as a forward dependence. The value is carried forward in the iteration space backward dependence is denoted as greater than. So, this direction means dependence is from iteration i to the iteration i minus k. In other words, you compute in iteration i and uh, you are using it in a previous iteration i minus k. So, it, this sounds a bit weird, definitely it is weird, it is not possible to have this type of a direction vector component in single loops. because loops run in one direction you know you cannot come back uh, and execute one of the previous iterations again. But as we will see later in doubly nested or higher levels of nesting it is possible to have this type of a component in one of the inner uh, loops. Okay. Outer loop cannot have uh, greater than component, but one of the inner loops can definitely have the greater than component in its direction vector equal to direction vector is denoted as equal and that means the dependence is in the same iteration. In other words computed in iteration i and used in iteration i. So, here we had that example. So, for example, here you know u 1 was here and u 1 was here. So, we are actually uh, using uh, reading something here and then writing into it again. So, this is in the same iteration of i and also j. So, that is why the two direction vectors are equal here. Whereas, uh, we uh, you know wrote into v 4 in i equal to 1 and j equal to 1, read in i equal to 1 and j equal to 2. That is why the it is uh, the direction vector component is equal to and less than. Now, so what exactly is a data dependence graph and how is it related to factorization. You take each statement, so we are considering stores uh, statements, we are not looking at binary or intermediate code here. So, each statement uh, is a node, okay. so in the data dependence graph. So, individual nodes are statements of the program and edges depict data dependence among the 
statements. So, we are going to see some examples to understand uh, all this better. If the data dependence graph is acyclic, then vectorization of the program is straightforward. So, we will see how this happens. So, vector code generation can be done using a topological sort order on the data dependence graph. If suppose uh, the data dependence graph is cyclic, so then there is a complication. So, what we do is uh, we find all the strongly connected components of the data dependence graph. Then reduce the DDG to an acyclic graph by treating each strongly connected component as a single node. So, the SCCs the strongly connected component themselves cannot be fully vectorized and the final code will have some sequential part and some vector part. Again we are going to see some examples of this. So, we will come back to this particular slide a little later after looking at an example. So, vectorization example. So, here is the original program and here is the vectorized program. So, you have for i equal to 1 to 99, S1 is x i equal to i, S2 is b i equal to 100 minus i. Then you have another loop for i equal to 1 to 99. S3 is a i equal to f of x i, f is some function of x i and x of i plus 1 is g of b i, again g is some function of b of i. Here is the data dependence graph for these four statements. Okay. S1, S2, S3, S4 correspond to the four statements S1, S2, S3, S4. This shows that there is a dependence from S1 to S3. So, let us understand it. This is S1, this is S3. So, this says x i equal to i. So, that means x 1 equal to 1, x 2 equal to 2, x 3 equal to 3 etcetera. There is some initialization which has happened. And then you have in S3 a i equal to f of x i, f is some function. So, uh, some expression of uh, x of i say x i plus 1, x i plus 2 etcetera etcetera. So, that means, uh, we are reading x of i here and writing into x of i here. So, there is a flow dependence from S1 to S3. Okay. So, that is the show that is what is shown here S1 to S3. And since these two are in two different uh, loops, this is I loop uh, and this is another independent loop, there is no direction vector component shown here. Direction vector components are shown for accesses within the same loop. Then we have another dependence from uh, S1 to S4 and that is an output dependence. So, S1 is again x i equal to i, S4 is x i plus 1 equal to g of b i. So, here we have x 1 equal to 1, x 2 equal to 2 etcetera, here we have x 2 equal to something, x 3 equal to something etcetera etcetera. So, we write into x in S1 and after the i loop uh, here terminates, the second loop again writes into locations of x. That means, there is an output dependence from S1 to S4. What about uh, S2 and S4? There seems to be a dependence from S2 to S4, which is of the flow kind. S2 is b i equal to 100 minus i and uh, S4 is x i plus 1 equal to g of b i. So, that means, we write into b i here and read b i here, but these two are in two different loops. So, there is no direction vector component, just a dependence. Uh, you know writing into b and reading from b. So, S2 to S4 there is a flow dependence which is shown as an arc. It also shows an arc from S3 to S4 labeled as delta. So, S3 to S4. So, f of x i means uh, you read uh, from x i, x i plus 1 equal to means you write into x i. So, but uh, you should observe here that this runs as uh, the right hand side runs as x 1, x 2, x 3 etcetera, whereas the left hand side in S 4 runs as x 2, x 3, x 4 etcetera. So, in other words in i equal to 1 we write into x 2, but we read from x 1. In i equal to 2 we write into x 3, but we read from x 2. x 2 was written with in the value i equal to iteration i equal to 1. So, that means, whatever was written into in S 4 is being read in 
S 3. So, there is a flow dependence from S 4 to S 3, which is of the form delta, okay. not from S 3 to S 4, S 4 to S 3, the picture is correct. So, this is how uh, the dependences are in this particular uh, dependence graph and there is no dependence from S 1 to S 2. So, you can see that it does not even share uh, variables arrays, okay. so there is no dependence. So, now it is easy to see that this particular graph is uh, acyclic, you know there are no cycles in the graph. So, what we said is uh, if the graph is uh, acyclic then vector code generation can be done using a topological sort order on the data dependence graph. So, if you do a topological sort order on uh, this particular graph, you can actually vectorize uh, S 1 and then you can uh, vectorize S 2 because there is no dependence from S 1 to S 2. Then you vectorize uh, S 4 and finally, you vectorize S 3. Why? So, S 1 is easy to understand, there are no statements which actually S 1 is dependent on. So, x of 1 to 99 is uh, just constant 1 to 99, this is corresponding to S 1 here. Then S 2 is also not dependent on any other statement. So, we can vectorize S 2 also straight away. This is S 2 B i equal to 100 minus i and we have B of 1, 9, 1 to 99 equal to 99 colon 1 colon minus 1. So, this is 100 minus i the constant. Now, it is not possible to vectorize uh, S 3 before S 4, because the dependence says whatever is computed in S 4 is used in S 3, so, but we have finished S 1 and S 2. So, we can actually vectorize S 4 after them, but we could not have vectorized S 4 before S 1 and S 2, because there are dependences uh, to S 4. So, S 4 is x of i plus 1 equal to g of uh, b i. So, x of 2 colon 100 is g of b colon b, uh, b g of b of 1 to 99. Now, the last statement which remains is S 3. So, that can be very easily vectorized. This is uh, a i equal to f of x i. So, a of 199 is uh, f of x of 1 to 99. So, we did a topological ordering of the nodes which gave us S 1, S 2, S 4, S 3 and we have emitted vector code because this graph is acyclic. So, let us look at a slightly more complicated uh, example. This loop is nested. So, for i equal to 1 to 100 do, then for j equal to 1 to 100 do, then inside that we have another k loop and a, a, an l loop. So, for i, I, I and j loops are common to both these statements s 1 and s 2, but uh, s 1 is nested only inside k loop and S 2 is nested only in the L loop. So, k equal to 1 to 100 do x of i comma j plus 1 comma k is equal to a of i comma j comma k plus 10 and L equal to 1 to 50 do a of j i plus 1 comma j comma L is x of i comma j comma L plus 5. So, if you look at this uh, code, here is the dependence graph and uh, it shows that there is a dependence from S 1 to S 2, which is of the flow kind that is delta. The dependence vector is equal to and less than. Similarly, there is a dependence from uh, S 2 to S 1, which is of the flow kind that is uh, delta of e and uh, direction vector is less than and equal to. So, there is a dependence from S 1 to S 2 rather two dependences from S 1 to S 2 both are written in brackets. Let me explain why. As I told you k and l are actually two different depend you know loops. So, the only dependence uh, between them can be written as flow and T R output. There can be no direction vector components. So, that is why just to indicate that the loop uh, loops are k and l, I have shown this as delta of k l and delta bar of uh, k l that corresponds to the dependences from S, S 1 to S 2. So, here is uh, you know the left hand side and here is the right hand side. So, there is a right possibility from here to here and the read possibility from here to here. So, that gives you both delta and delta bar for different values of k and l. 
So, that is what this is. Now, let me show you why the dependences occur. So, we have i equal to 1, i equal to 2 etcetera in here and j equal to 1, j equal to 2, j equal to 3 etcetera along this path, along this column. So, we have expanded the expressions here and substituted i equal to 1, j equal to 1 etcetera. So, the first statement S 1 becomes x of 1 comma 2 comma k and here we have a comma 1 comma a of 1 comma 1 comma k. The second one becomes uh, S 2 is a of 2 comma 1 comma L which is x of 1 comma 1 comma L. So, that is the right I did not write 5 and 10 I just uh, skipped it for uh, brevity. Similarly, i equal to 2 you get x of 2 comma 2 comma k etcetera etcetera. So, similarly j equal to 2 i equal to 1 here are the enumerations. It is easy to see that this uh, x 1 2 k is same in uh, i equal to 1 and j equal to 2 x 1 2 l. So, for uh, different va some values of k and l there is going these are going to be the same and therefore, there will be a dependence from this to this. Similarly, x 1 3 k and x 1 3 l there is going to be a dependence from s 1 to s 2. So, that is really what is shown as delta equal to and less than why is it equal to it is in the same iteration of i and why is it less than. So, this is j equal to 1 and this is j equal to 2 1 less than 2 this is j equal to 2 and this is j equal to 3 2 less than 3 etcetera etcetera. So, delta of equal to and less than is here. So, this is the dependence from s 1 to s 2. What about the dependence from s 2 to s 1? So, s 2 is a of 2 comma 1 comma l and in i equal to 2 and j equal to 1 you have a comma 2 a of 2 comma 1 comma k. So, for some values of k and l this will be equal and therefore, whatever is written it to here in i equal to 1 and j equal to 1 is read in i equal to 1 i equal to 2 and j equal to 1. So, you can easily similarly see that a 2 2 l and a 2 2 k are identical a 2 3 l and 2 3 k are also identical. So, this corresponds to the dependence delta of less than and equal to why the first component is i. So, i equal to 1 and i equal to 2. So, written into in i equal to 1 read in i equal to 2. So, that means 1 less than 2 that is why the first component is less than. The second component is equal to because both the dependences are in the same value of j, j equal to 1 and j equal to 1, but I must point out that the j equal to 1 here and the j equal to 1 here are in two different values of i that means, two different instantiations of the same j loop, okay. but that does not uh, uh, that is not uh, what we consider we just look at the values of j this is one of the limitations of the direction vector it does not consider different instantiations of the inner loops, but it suffices for our work. So, we have the two direction vectors uh, written here. Now, this is where uh, the problem arises there is a cycle here right. Whenever there is a cycle like this the rule that we are going to follow is given in this particular slide. So, any dependence with a forward direction in an outer loop will be satisfied by the serial execution of the outer loop. So, if we if an outer loop L is run in sequential mode then all the dependences with a forward direction in the outer level of L will be automatically satisfied even those of the loops inner to L all these will be automatically satisfied. But the problem is if this is uh, if this is not true for those dependences with equal to direction at the outer level. The dependences of the inner loops will have to be satisfied by appropriate statement ordering and loop execution order. So, dependence with less than direction vector in an outer loop will be satisfied by serial execution of the outer loop. This is what is important for us in this case. The i loop cannot be vectorized because of the cycle. So, you can see that the cycle is in the i loop. Okay. Uh, then once we actually run the i loop in sequential mode 
the dependences of the inner loops will automatically satisfied. This is what I said. I will show you examples of how this happens a little later. But uh, here, just believe that the JKL loops can be vectorized once the I loop is run in sequential mode. So, the reason is uh, if we run I equal to 1, I equal to 2, etcetera, etcetera, in sequential mode, all these executions happen first and then these executions happen. So, because of that, this dependence which runs from 1 to 2 of i value will be automatically satisfied right. We run this first and then this. So, this this would have been written in 2 first and then we written uh, i equal to 2. So, this will can be read appropriately without any trouble. What about this? Here the you know i equal to 1 uh, all these are going to be run right. So, here is uh, the value of uh, i and uh, here is the value of j. So, we are going to run all the uh, you know iterations of i in sequential mode and uh, all the iterations of uh, j possibly in parallel mode. So, that is uh, the way it is. So, let us uh, assume that this works properly. I will show you examples of why this works properly a little later. So, if assuming that uh, this is correct, j k l loops can be vectorized. So, i loop is run in sequential mode, then the j loop and the k loop can be actually run in uh, parallel mode. So, x of something equal to a of something plus 10 and a of something equal to x of something plus 5. So, this is uh, exactly how it happens. So, here is the reason why uh, you know I promise that I will give you reasons uh, why vectorization can happen in the j loop and the k loop. So, here is the reason. So, let us assume that the i loop is run in sequential mode, then the dependence diagram changes as I have shown here. The dependences change, there are so for example, uh, the i dependences are all gone you know. So, the, the there was a dependence here from this to this S 2 to S 1 right on the less than part. So, that is gone. So, we do we take it away there is nothing at all. Whereas, uh, we had uh, dependence you know from S 1 to S 2 on the second one the equal to part uh, uh, is a trivially satisfied. So, there is no need to worry about uh, the equal to component from S 2 to S 1 because we do not reorder statements we just keep the statement ordering as S 1 to S 2 automatically the equal to part is uh, satisfied. So, now there will only be one dependence which is less than from S 1 to S 2. So, that is here S 1 to S 2 with the delta. So, we have shown i in red that means it is run in sequential mode. So, the only dependences are from uh, this to this and from this to the from this to this. Okay. So, you see that uh, there are no cycles in this particular uh, graph anymore. So, because of the absence of cycles, it is possible to vectorize these loops. That is the basic uh, reason why it can be vectorized. Now, suppose the program is changed even a little bit. Okay. So, the previous uh, program had i j plus 1 k and i plus 1 j l, whereas uh, here we have i plus 1 j plus 1 l. So, that is the only change that we made. Dependence has changed. So, now the previous uh, ones had dependence from S 2 to S 1, S 1 to S 2 and S 1 to S 2. Here we have uh, S 2 to S 1, S 1 to S 2 and S 1 to S 2 again, but the direction vector components have changed. So, please observe that the previous direction vectors were less than equal to and equal to less than, whereas here it is less than less than and uh, equal to less than. So, these are two different ones. Even now, the i loop can be run in uh, sequential mode and uh, the j loop can be vectorized. So, this is the vector code that will be produced. Reasons for this will become a little uh, clearer a little later. So, the so here are the dependences for uh, this particular changed program. So, the dependences for from here to here and here to here, here to here and here to here that is why the dependences have changed to delta less than less than. So, this part and delta equal to less than remains as it is. Okay. So, this is the changed part. 
Then we take up another example which shows uh, what happens uh, if uh, we actually have to generate code uh, 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 after computing the strongly connected components. So, here is a program S 1, S 2, S 3, S 4, there is an I loop in which there is a statement S 1, then there is a J loop in which there is a statement S 2, then there is a statement uh, S 3 which is inside the K loop and then finally, S 4 is one more which is inside the J loop. Okay. So, the K loop has only S 3 whereas, the J loop has S 2 and S 4 and along with this uh, K loop dependences are complex. So, we will understand these dependences uh, later, but uh, please observe that uh, there are number of cycles here. See S 4 to S 1 is a dependence, here is S 4, uh, you know this is S 1. So, we uh, y of i plus j to y i, this is the dependence from S 4 to S 1. There is a dependence on S 4 itself. So, that is because of uh, you know this particular uh, loop i. Okay, which is enclosing this, it is independent you know. So, this is y of i plus j equal to a of j plus 1 comma n. So, when the i loop changes there is going to be a dependence from S 4 to S 4 itself. Then we have uh, a dependence from S 4 to S 3 and S 3 to S 4. Finally, another dependence from S 3 to S 2 and S 3 to S 2 to S 3. One more, uh, there are uh, again dependences from S3 to S3 and S3 to S3. So this is a very complex uh, data dependence graph. For the present, we are only interested in the loop structure of these uh, data dependence graphs. So because of the loop structure at the I level, okay, if, uh, we cannot really vectorize this code directly. So let's assume that we run the I loop in sequential mode. So, there are strongly connected components here, one is here and another one is here. So, both these together actually come into the same, there are two loops. So, both these actually come into the same strongly connected component, S 2, S 3, S 4 together forms an SCC because of the two loops here which are connected. So, S 1 is not uh, in the SCC. So, we have S 1 and then uh, the SCC S 2, S 3, S 4 together. So, we can generate vector code for S 1, but S 2, S 3, S 4 is run within the sequential uh, I loop. Okay. So, now what happens? So, if we, if the uh, actually the level 2 diagram becomes like this. So, we, we had this, so we are now expanding this. Okay. So, there is a loop from S 2 to S 3, but uh, there is no other loop in the system. The outer loop has been removed, this loop has been removed. You know the I loop has been removed, only this particular loop uh, at the lower level at the J level remains. So, here with this loop we, this is a strongly connected component. So, S 2 and S 3 are grouped together, S 4 remains as it is. So, we can vectorize S 4 within J for the J loop, but uh, S 2 and S 3 have to be within uh, embedded within J, they has, J has to be run sequentially and S 2 S 3 are inside. So, I runs sequentially, J runs sequentially, S 2 and S 3 are inside, S 4 is uh, vectorized for the J loop and S 1 is vectorized for the I loop. Then we have uh, this, uh, this particular data dependence graph level 3, S 3 to S 2 with uh, single dependence. So, this can be vectorized at the uh, you know K level. So, what we really have done is uh, vectorize S 3 at the k level and S 4 has already been vectorized. So, please see that S 4 has already been vectorized, S 1 has also been vectorized, only S 2 and S 3 remain. So, we cannot do much for S 2, it uh, remains within uh, J loop and it is not uh, vectorizable as it is, because it, must, it has nothing more to vectorize. Whereas, S 3 is embedded within the uh, look, look at the original program, it is embedded within the k loop, so which can be vectorized. So, we have vectorized the k loop okay, and uh, here it is, this is the vector code for uh, the k loop and this is the final code that has been generated for this particular uh, cyclic uh, data dependence graph hierarchically. We constructed the 
SCCs, then group the statements appropriately, generated code for uh, the statements outside the group, the SCC. Finally, considered the SCC one by one, then again we looked at the loops and strongly connected components within this data dependence graph and uh, we again isolated the loop you know statements which are outside the strongly connected component generated code for it and this goes on finally you may end up generating only sequential code if there is uh, a loop even at the lowest level but uh, hopefully this does not happen in all data dependence uh, graphs so this is uh, the end of uh, today's lecture and uh, next time we will start discussion on data dependence direction vectors thank you